Please welcome Wayne Westfall. Probably already done the math. Um, there was 27 years ago that I did the first poem that I ever did. And that happened to be um, a love poem for my wife on our 25th anniversary. So I, like the math would uh, determine, that was 27 years ago. And I've been writing ever since. Um, the first few years, uh, what I wrote had to do with love stories for family and friends and retirement, uh, poems for people that retired, who I worked with. But then, uh, somewhere along the line, I got the idea that it might be better to change my direction and, yes, do a few anniversary and birthday, po birthday poems, but can branch out to more general interest and uh, try and entertain people a little bit. And what I do now are more story poems. They're actually stories that have a beginning and a middle and an ending, and um, a conclusion at, at the end that sometimes is, is a twist from what you were understanding as you were hearing the poem or reading it. Um, yeah, and, and sometimes my point of view you'll see, and sometimes you'll just, at the end, you'll just say, uh -huh, yeah, I'll, I agree with that. That's, that's the way it is. That's kind of what I've been trying to do the last uh, 20 some years. <laughs> the first one I'd like to read, and you can keep your applause to the end as well, whatever, you can smile, and that's, that's good. Uh, the first story is, is just plain. Um, it's a true story. Some of what I do is fiction, some of what I do is fantasy, some of what I do is actually based on a real situation. And this one was based on a real situation, uh, a ride in a bus in Hawaii. And I think uh, you should do the aha thing at the end of this one. She, she stood upon her feet, this lady, stern yet sweet, and presently commanded me to take her empty seat. She couldn't see my hair beneath the hat I wear, yet somehow she decoded me without a questionnaire. Declining first I tried that seat unoccupied, then dawned on me the thing which she had subtly implied. A bus's rule is sweet. If standing on their feet, the elderly must always be directed to a seat. Although I caused a fuss aboard the crowded bus where she saw me as elderly, must I accept it thus? The eyes that I look through see skies of pink and blue, but can it be the world sees me as human residue? The world is like a stage, scripted page by page, and just like me, You'll someday see the end of middle age. The play you must complete, so old you'll finally meet. When someone stands and then demands you take the empty seat. <laughs> <laughs> this next poem is uh, pure fiction. Sort of got started on this um, and plans to attend a high school reunion. In this case, it was a 60 year reunion. But that was only what got, got the poem started. Everything in it is total fiction. So just realize that. I've always been the fervent kind, but having been so long away, when meeting comrades left behind, I wonder what we'll find to say. Returning to my childhood town, a notion rears its ugly head. While some survive, yet won't be found, most by now are cold and dead. 
So, options few, I find the place where those deceased lie on the grass. Call to mind a youthful face. I contemplate the distant past. One by one, encounters made. I'm deeply moved by every word. Though warmed by memories displayed, I read some things I never heard. How sad the life of Bob McMoore, who taken to a foreign shore, returned a casualty of war and life before could not restore. We're reading headstones, in case you haven't figured that out. A senator was Sam Soufli, who lived a life of luxury until he met her privately and then was humbled publicly. A gutsy fireball was Saul, when sailing through a deadly squall, it seems he caused the yawl to stall, which sank the boat, crew and all. Resolute and stubborn Joe, a man who swam against the flow, when hearing it was time to go, resisted till he couldn't say no. A lovely sweetheart, Mary Jane, Although at times a scatterbrained, suppose she could outrun the train and bravely try it, alas, in vain. <laughs> Said brash and bold, outspoken Bill, a fervent fan of overkill, you'll see me dead when earth stands still. But such a vow could not fulfill. It's funny how a graveyard walk can bring to life the cold and dead. But if you think that rocks can't talk, just walk and read what I have read. Uh-huh. <laughs> not quite, not quite. Oh. <laughs> then, uh, then when you leave this place of bones, like mine, your softened heart will race and wish each epitaph in stone could be instead a wrinkled face. <laughs> this next story is uh, another true one. It's, it's on the sad side. Um, most people have pets. We had a pet. This pet was a little puppy. There always comes a time when you have to lose your little puppy, and it's a very sad time. This story is a, I call it a poemized version of a letter that my wife wrote for our puppy a couple of years ago, who we had to put away. And she wrote the letter in, in long form, as most people would. And it's, if you want to see it, I'll put it on the back there. There's, yeah, I took everything that's in my poem directly from her letter. A lot of the very same words and same phrases are in here. So anyhow, um, I'll do my best. The title is Goodbye, My Little Lacy Love. Goodbye, My Little Lacy Love. I cannot bear to say goodbye. You are a gift from heaven above, and now I cry. All day I cry. I miss you more than I can say. I cannot stand that you're not here to serve and comfort night and day. Oh, how I loved you, Lacey, dear. You were sick so very long, and though you knew to go outside, when came the need so very strong, you tried so hard, I know you tried. But when you couldn't make the door, you only did what you could do. And I was pleased to clean the floor, because my love was deep for you. But near the end, you couldn't walk and needed me to carry you. And yes, I did, while tears I fought, because my love was deep and true. My bed was on the floor at night, nearby, in case you needed me. And when you did, 
I held you tight, soft and scripted. And I wanted you. I'll never forget your favorite things. The hedgehog toy by the week. Your yellow dog, your duck with wings, your green peeps bunny with a super squeak. The long red pillow on the kitchen floor, <coughs> popcorn snacks by the new TV. Greeting me home at the open door, sleeping each night on the bed with me. You loved that place by the dining room door, where you'd be warmed by the afternoon sun. Those hikes by the lake where you'd explore and then return when you were done. No, there shall never come a day when I will fail to long with you the joy and peace you brought my way. And all the things I loved about you, the tricks you learned and put on display. Sit and down over and walk, bang your dead and shake and pray. My, how you made the people talk. A traveler you were by car and by plane asleep in your crate, unnoticed by all. A watchdog you were, until it was plain the stranger was welcome who came to call. Companion, friend, ah, you were the best. Never, ever will be forgotten. With you by my side, I truly was blessed. Your pain now ended, mine has begun. Goodbye, my little lacy love. I cannot bear to say goodbye. You were a gift from heaven above. Now I cry. All day I The next story is Silly Fantasy. Change, change, change the, uh, change everything up here on God's side. Silly Fantasy, and your object is to figure out who I am as I read through the story. You find out at the end. You might find out in the middle somewhere. I may be tall, I may be short. But either way, I live for sport. And though they come and slip away, I'm planted here while others play. I relish summer, spring, and fall, but just abide the winter squalls. squalls. And while I love both sun and rain, abundance may be cause of pain. Though moans and groans offend my ear, encouragement I also hear. And music sweet floats overhead as noble words of praise are said. Voices come from everywhere, smells delicious fill the air. And pretty colors red through green make men a handsome war machine. Flags I see of yellow hue and patriotic red, white, blue as lines of might both left and right impact or fancies day and night. Support I do the strong and fast and root for both the first and last. But making good my purpose role plain wears me down and takes a toll. So when impaired by snow or sleet or sun or rain or glove or clear, Folks rally round and take a knee in order to furbish me. Yes, life is tough, but every day I wish that I could stand and say, I'm proud to be the field of play for football men of the USA. <laughs> This is another sad story of sorts, an adaptation of a, a real event uh, my son had in a hospital, although the scene in the story that I'm writing is not a hospital. But that's where this situation really occurred, originally. Visiting a friend one day, I'm struck by sadness in her eyes. 
And as I search for words to say, she takes a smile and softly sighs. With salty streaks down wrinkled cheeks, her agony she cannot hide. And haltingly, she slowly speaks emotions buried deep inside. I heard from Jane, she says through tears, who told me what her doctor said. From recent tests, he says he fears the cancer soon may be her dead. As close as siblings in our youth, we later dreamed of wealth untold, but never recognized the truth that pain may rule when we are old. So hearing what the doctor said, I fear the worst and often cry, imagining I'm at her bed, struggling with the word goodbye. The vision haunts me night and day and often brings me to my knees, where I look up to God and pray for healing of this grave disease. Your eyes reveal you truly care, and since relief I cannot find, I hope you have some words to share this, to mollify my troubled mind. She looks at me expectantly, but silence trumps some old cliché. So gifted words, eluding me, mute I stand with naught to say. When I was young, I married a girl who loved on me most all the time. But then one day, this precious pearl was snatched away before the prime. We all accept the wise man's verse, a time for birth and a time to die. Yet like my friend, I curse the curse and grapple with the question, why? So knowing well the pain I see and heartstrings given a tender tug, I act upon what's stirring me and offer comfort with a hug. Then, memories refreshed and raw, I add one more as tears accrue. Not to heed some friendship law, but honestly, I need one too. This is another fictional story <clears throat> with a, uh, a twist and a touch of reality at the end. Let's just put it that way. Oh my gosh. I've read this before to other groups and they never understood what was happening throughout the story. So I'm going to just give you a clue since you don't have a chance to reread it. Yeah. You can only hear it once. This is a story. The, the first, let's just say the first half of the story is a dream. It's not reality, it's, it's, it's a dream. That should help your perspective as I read here. With ticket in hand, I find the way leading me to gate C2. A grouping friends who came today, I motion them to follow me. Then hurry on since I don't know how far it is we need to go. Pausing for coffee at the Lone Cafe, I kindly declined their eggs and ham. Preferring to lunch on the plane today, potatoes, carrots, and leg of lamb. So, I'm good to go with my cup of joe and a trusty suitcase I carried to stow. Advancing down the corridor, we marvel at it. Uh, pictures, we marvel at photos of my flying craft, a Lockheed Electra with turboprops fore and beautiful lines from fore and aft. But I tarry not with my cup of joe and the heavy suitcase I carry to stow. Not soon enough we reach the gate and look for seats, alas, in vain. But having still some time to wait, we scan the tarmac for my plane. And drinking in the scene below, I slowly sip my cup of joe. Excuse me, sir, your plane is here. 
So please get up and follow me. The uniformed lady's message is clear, but my mind's a whirl like a stormy sea. Gone is the warm and peaceful glow I knew till awakened a moment ago. There is no coffee cup nearby. And as I walk to the airplane door, I laugh out loud as I understand why. Then boarding the jet with engines for my fading green, I tried to stow, yet can't quite seem to let it go. In days of old, we boarded planes, ham or steak, our lone concern. But then one day, the world was changed, and travel took an ugly turn. Yet still we fly, and still a glow remains of flights of long ago. Today as I fly, it comes to mind that airport scanners safeguard me. But had I power to time rewind, just give me the old days, I would plead. Yet while a dream can't make it so, I'll be just fine with a peaceful glow. <laughs> One more. We're getting close to the end here, I know. Uh, I'll read this real fast. This is this is more fantasy than this is silly fantasy. Just, I don't know. It's, I hope you like it anyway. Uh, just remember, it's totally fantasy. <laughs> the scorching Alabama sun. This has to do with a banana skin, a fly, a buzzard, and something else, a lizard. The scorching Alabama sun was more than just a fair excuse for the cast-aside banana skin to beckon, come and taste my juice. What's left of me I freely share, so if you crawl or walk or fly, draw near, partake, and be refreshed before I'm toasted, crisp and dry. Message aired and message heard, a tiny lizard slips aboard, intentions silent, undisclosed, and by a hungry fly, Ignored. Cautiously, the lizard turns to focus at this meal on this meal nearby, but a flip of the tongue, a fraction light, precludes all hope of a second try. In time, commotion in the air becomes a cloud that soon descends, discernible for what it is. That angry fly with a hundred friends. But lizards live to feast on bugs, so looking up he has a hunch that such a timely, bold display is preview of a lavish lunch. Prepared for certain all-out war, alone with not a friend in sight, and waiting for the first attack, he crafts a plan to end this fight. No quarter asked, no quarter given. The skirmish might continue still, except, attracted by the flies, a buzzard dives, intent to kill. But lizards live because they're quick, alert, with sharp and roving eyes. So, smartly dodging, hungry claws, he won't become a buzzard's prize. The bird swings back and glides above, considering a second try, but feeding prospects unimproved, he bids the fruitless skin goodbye. As well, the tired fly departs, postponing lunch and leaving friends. He hides beneath a bush nearby until the evening breeze descends. Returning to the place of war, to feast upon what was put aside, he's unprepared for what he sees, and by these words is horrified. I said, Partake and be refreshed before I'm toasted crisp and dry. But like the lizard, you're too late. And like the bird, I say goodbye. Yes, win and lose are facts of life. And of the things that shape our fate, perhaps the one most overlooked is being just a trifle late. <laughs> Wayne Westfall, thanks so much. Let's give Wayne another hand. Okay, so uh, we're going to take a
short break, about 10 minutes, and then we'll come back for our open mic.